We are living in the era of national populism. And this man, Andre Modi, like Erdogan, like Netanyahu, like Orban, have to organize elections to tell the people, I am the people. people. Yeah. I, in, they need this popular mandate. So they have to take the risk of losing elections. I really strongly believe that what we need is a radical new imaginations about how we will balance the economy so that you have decent work and in yeah. funding. Yeah. Well, I'm not hearing that. I'm not I'm hearing that we they're distributing this, we'll distribute that, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. It's not a radical new imagination of how we manage our economy, how we manage our country. It is a minority, perhaps, of the whole of Indian society. But it is a very substantial minority. And active. The ideology of Hindutva is very deeply rooted in, in society. And that makes me less convinced than I want to be, <laughs> uh, if you will, at the idea of you know a cycle having come to an end. Except that the antidote in terms of narrative to Hindutva is cast. We find that when you have weak coalition governments, you actually get a strong and activist court. Mm. So what happened to the court under Mr. Indira Gandhi? Mm. Very similar to what has happened today. Yeah. And then where did judicial activism come about? When there were coalition governments in power. So I think the people of India and the politics of India has to change. Then it will be relatively easy to bring back these institutions. Namaste, uh, Zimbabwe. I mean, I welcome you all to a new episode of the series of conversations we are uh, organizing around the state of the Indian Republic. Um, I'm privileged here. We are sitting actually in Hyderabad in the South Asia Institute, uh, and we heard and are two of the finest minds and hearts concerned with uh, with Indian democracy with us. And here, uh, it can start with. Uh, Rahul Bukherjee, who was recently director of the South Asia Institute and is a professor, head of department of political science. Uh, we have Christoph Jaffrano, uh, who is uh, widely acknowledged as being one of the uh, most uh, informed uh, analysts and observers of uh, democracy and its uh, and it, uh, feelings uh, in, 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 in recent years. He's a professor at the King's College in London and in the Sciences Board, which is the People's Science I don't know, of Paris. And, uh, uh, and here's uh, um, John Harris. John Harris is, is one of the most uh, senior scholars on India, I think, many decades. <laughs> uh, he's a professor emeritus international. In the International School of Feminine Peace and University, he worked earlier as a as faculty at LSC SOAS and and has had also a very illustrious career. Uh, so wonderful to have you all with us, and and, and let's continue the let's start right away. My first question is uh, is that I am recording we recording at a time when. Uh, uh, ten years of 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 uh, the prime ministership of Mr. Modi uh, has reached a, a new landmark. Uh, but uh, but my first question is: uh, What extent did the ten years of of Modi in his first term? To what extent? What did it do to Indian democracy? Am I right in, in my understanding that Indian democracy was badly battered in multiple ways uh, in these 10 years? Uh, and if so, you know, what was the kind of damage that happened to Indian democracy? So, Ram, why don't we start with them? 
Yes, I think uh, it was badly battered and uh, sort of sought to be completely decimated in the last 10 years, apart from some of the resilience that we have seen in recent times, which has come as much from civil society and to a certain extent from political parties. And that battering has a clear ideological position that did not exist in the Indian past. Uh, in the past, we have had authoritarian propensities driven by political opportunism. Mm -hmm. But in the current phase, we find a convergence of political opportunism and cross at ethno nationalism. The, the ideological project and the political project have converged. And Brown, if it's an interim to just for gender audience, what do you mean by ethno nationalism? Uh, ethno nationalism can be of a variety of types. You know, it can be based on race, it can be based on religion, it can be based on other markers as well. In the Indian case, obviously the convenient marker is the majority Hindu deity. So, whereas, despite its many failings, uh, what we call Hinduism today has an enormous capacity to be plural. It has many, many negatives, uh, such as oppression and discrimination, but it has an amazing capacity to be plural. It is very diverse. This is sought to be reduced to a category, which looks to me like a rather new category based on uh, a certain kind of an experiment where you homogenize a whole lot of people who are called Hindus into an identity which is made to feel as if it is threatened by the minority community. And uh, the feeling of this threat is then mobilized in politics. So when I say ideological, that is the mart. Mm -hmm. When I say convenient, uh, it is assumed that it has to a very great extent been able to mobilize people in its direction, almost unbelievably. And the manner in which it has decimated in institutions is the following. Uh, we have done some research on this. One pathway of that is just to interpret old laws in a different way. Mm -hmm. To attack opposition politicians and civil society organizations. The second is where political opposition is very powerful, change the law in preventing. And the third is where political opposition is weak completely displace earlier laws. And in this manner, you want to decimate the political opposition by intimidating both the civil society that wants to uphold the constitution and which is the bulwark for politics, which actually seeks to protect the constitution. And it is for these reasons that I believe that this is a very unusual moment in the history of India. Thanks, uh, Christopher. You've, uh, you've written extensively, but uh, your book on uh, India and Devoti is, I think, will remain in history one of the most significant and important resources uh, to reflect on what happened in these 10 years. Um, just looking at the lens of the practice of democracy, uh, which is electoral, but democracy, of course, means a lot more. What what got damaged during these 10 years? Well, many things indeed, and I would like simply to elaborate on what Raul has just said. For me, the impact is twofold. Yeah. One, you make what was a multicultural society majoritarian. And therefore, the first casualties are the minorities, yeah. transforming minorities into second class citizens. And you do it de facto by letting vigilante groups exerting cultural policing at the grassroots level very violently, and not only symbolically violently, but of course physically violently. And we have this series of finchings, we have this series of riots. And the state is protecting these groups. The police is protecting these groups. You know, you can't I distinguish. In Kaiting. Exactly. You yeah. can you can say that the police has subcontracted yeah. some some of the job they were supposed to do. 
Yeah. So cultural policing is definitely one dimension of this transformation of minorities into second class citizens. But from this de facto majoritarianism, we see a de jure majoritarianism taking shape as well with new laws. The most famous one, of course, is the Citizenship Amendment Act. But if you look at the state level, you have the laws making interreligious marriages almost impossible, conversion almost impossible. So we have, this is for me, the first thing to say, the transformation of democracy. I agree a lot. I, I was in Egypt talked recently about the clouds of tourism were, uh, you know, gathering over India. So, yeah, that you, you haven't straightforwardly said Muslims don't have citizenship rights. You haven't straightforwardly said interreligious marriages are unlawful. But you, you use the law. Uh, in such a way that effectively this is what is yeah. being described. And my fear is, my my deep fear is, is that we have therefore in the making what I call a deeper state, mm -hmm. a state that is not only made of officials who could be replaced mm -hmm. if there is a change of board at the center, but a state that is related now to very deeply embedded activists who control mm -hmm. the streets who control what's going on in society. And when we saw the Congress coming back in Rajasthan, coming back in Karnataka, but not in a position to return to square one, mm -hmm. so far as the minorities were concerned, that's definitely something that goes beyond the political. It becomes a kind of societal issue. Mm -hmm. uh, and ghettoization is another symptom of that. Mixed neighborhoods becoming much more complicated. And again, de facto and de jure. In Gujarat, you have a law making it impossible to sell your house to someone who is not from your community without the permission of the district collector. Right. So that's the first major damage. And the other one, of course, is, as Raul said, the institutions being breaking down. erased, to, to bro broken, ended. Uh, the Supreme Court... The election commission, you know, two pillars of the rule of law, uh, mm -hmm. just yes. examples of this. We could find many others. Yeah. But here, I'm wondering, have they succumbed to pressure or have they anticipated pressure? Mm -hmm. Or are they ideologically chosen? You see, that is even more problematic. So it, it is a journalist uh, promoting the ideology of, of Hini. Uh, uh, to for for their career, or are they doing, or are they f fearful of losing their jobs, or do they actually believe it? My fear is that the increasing segments of the judiciary, the media, and the civil service to which I belong, which are ideologically driven, and yeah. that's going to be much harder to deal with. Yeah, in that case, we are somewhat back to the emergency period. Uh, you you mentioned journalist. You remember this very very famous sentence. They were asked to bend and they crawled. Absolutely. So, is it, this is really a key question again. Is it something that they believe in? Or is it something that they may, they are prepared to, to change if power also changes? And we will only know after seeing power changes if one day it changes. So, yeah, and we've come to what, what we can look, look for in the future. Uh, but you know, 10 years and this kind of transformation, at one level, it's stunning. But you do need to remember that Nazi Germany between Hitler's election, incidentally with 33% vote share, which was exactly with the vote share with which Mr. Nwangi <laughs> gave to power in 2014. And he would not have come to power at the same time the left had combined. And so, uh, with, with all of those ironies of history, between that and his defeat in suicide was 20 years. So, and a society. But there's a big difference, Arsh. Mm. After Hitler took over power, there was no election. Yeah, absolutely. We are in a different pattern. You know, we are living in the era of national populism. Mm -hmm. And this man, Andhra Modi, like Erdogan, like Netanyahu, like Orban, have to organize elections to tell the people, I am the people. people. Yeah. I in, they need this popular mandate. So they have to take the risk of losing elections. And in fact, Erdogan lost local elections recently. Netanyahu lost also and could, could, 
could come come back. But mm. it's a different game. The problem being that it's not a level level playing field, the electoral competition, mm. and that's why there are election. It's far from what level. <laughs> it's far from that level because of the media coverage, because of the money that is spent and the misuse of the state. But in spite of that, mm. in spite of that, we saw Narendra Modi losing his maturity. So that's why I would not put this regime in the same category as what we would call dictatorship, fascism. You know, between Putin's Russia and Modi's India, there is still this, this, this big difference. Now, how far that, how far can that and take how us? How far can that endure? Exactly. And secondly, how far can that take us so far from the original model that we will never come back to square one? You know, these are the other questions. Uh, can I just, but it's just the sentence because I just want to put a word to what uh, Christophe was saying. And I've called it competitive authoritarian. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is a situation in comparative politics research, which shows that, and, and, and that's why I think Christoph is right, that more, more regimes can actually become more democratic from a competitive authoritarian situation, because you can't completely kill the democratic of death person, which definitely prevents it. However, the challenges are as grave as yeah. we all agree. And, and John, uh, you know, as uh, probably uh, the oldest scholarly observer of, of India, Abad uh, Gaurifa, uh, and, uh, and uh, um, you know, how do you see those 10 years taking a longer kind of time span? Uh, uh, looking at uh, India as a, as a republic, you know, what happened in these 10 years? How much of uh, India's great democratic potential, uh, uh, you know, the uh, Churchill famously and many others were so skeptical about the capacity of this country to to, uh, to actually practice as a society uh, democracy. And uh, so much of it was proved wrong. What happened in the last two years? Yeah, and um, one thought that uh, I've had while my friends here have been have been talking and in answer to your questions, Harsh, has been to reflect that while there is no doubt it whatsoever in my mind that you know India democracy has had a tremendous battering over the last ten years, uh, we mustn't uh, mustn't forget that there is sadly a longer history uh, of just of of the. Uh, of the decline of, 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 of the dem democratic hopes and aspirations of the, of the Republic. Um, one point which sticks in my mind uh, from the work I've done recently, um, which has had me rereading the Constituent Assembly debates, for example, is the important occasions on which uh, it was said, no, usually by Ambedkar, sometimes by others, that how much would de depend it on the character of the leadership, of the, the, the character and the, int so much trust in the character and the integrity of the leaders. With the passage of Article 22, uh, that remarkable article of the, of the Constitution of India, uh, which we might sort of say, you know, uh, gives Indian citizens the right to be detained without, uh, without trial, without bail by the, uh, by the state. Um, it was, that was one of the occasions when uh, members of the Constituent Assembly said, uh, of, of course, we, 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 trust, we trust the leaders not to abuse the powers that they, that they have. And of course, over time, sadly, leaders have made full use of the powers that they have under the, under the Constitution. Leaders before Modi. Leaders before Modi. And we have to remember, you know, uh, legislation like the, uh, the draconian uh, unlawful UAPA, um, uh, okay, the Modi government has 
uh, made that legislation even more draconian than it was before. But heavens, it was already there. And it was misused. Maybe it was yeah. one or the three, but it, it was misused against the saint. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, what, what worries me uh, uh, in the, the present uh, situation is that um, a lot of the, the laws which have actually made, made it possible for this regime to operate in the way it has, it, it, it's, it's been a kind of legalized lawlessness, if you, if you will. The use of laws in, to perpetrate a certain kind of, of, of lawlessness. And I worry that, if you will, that the laws are, are, still, are still there. But I, I, I still wanted to underline something that Raoul well said to is that what makes this regime different uh, from the past is that it's ideologically driven. Yeah. And, 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 and I think that's something that doesn't have to bear in mind. Which brings me uh, to my central question uh, in this discussion. Uh, Mr. Modi is back, but this time he is heading an alliance. And it's an interesting alliance because it's not an ideological alliance. It's not, I mean, the, in, uh, his, his remaining in power is dependent on uh, two political parties, three political parties, which are not ideologically aligned to the RSS agenda from the nationalism. That's the check and balance possible. Uh, now, the three of you, maybe uh, some of the finest scholars, uh, social scientists, political scientists uh, that we have, but you're not as dumb I wish you were, but you know, even so, you're just based on your scholarship and your observation of the way in the politics and in society function. I, I, I want, you know, what's keeping me awake, you know, every night for, for weeks, simply that you know, that's is, is three sets of questions and let me place them one by one. The first of them, and I, to my mind, if I have to make a hierarchy of where it, I think in democracy as has, has, has most floundered, is, is the hate, is the hate that has become central to our political life. Uh, and I think Nazi Germany, to me, is continuous to the mind of democracy is not just about the will of the majority, because that can devolve into fascism. It is about the defense of every minority. And that's where I think we've seen the most severe backlink. I think many people, when, when I talk about what's happening to India's Muslim state, it's, it's about what is happening to a community. It's actually what's happening to the foundational idea of this country itself. <laughs> and, and, and therefore, it's, it's Pablo, it's not, it is about Kavanhagen and people and their future, but it's also about the future of, of all of India. So, is that going to change? I and mean, that's my first question. Do you think that uh, in, the, in the more uh, humbling uh, circumstances in which Mr. Modi has regained power, is it going to, in any way, restrain this government from steps that it wouldn't clearly have taken, a national uh, NRC, for instance, uh, backed by a CA, which means that it'll be a national NRC, which will basically be targeted at, at, at one community, the others will be protected. Uh, you know, using uh, reopening questions of, 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 of the boss. Uh, is in, in Kashi and uh, you know, Matara, uh, a uniform civil code which is clearly uh, against Muslim Boston law, uh, uh, and then so on. Uh, and a continuance of this kind of hate violence. Uh, at the time that we speak today, you see that an alarming right uh, in my work that you chose the hate violence. I'm seeing an alarming rights in, in hate violence, which which is really worrying for me. Uh, and the two alliance partners don't seem to be having too much of a problem with it. None of the political opposition is really speaking out against it. Uh, so, what is the future for India's Muslim minorities? What is the future for the defense of the foundation idea of India itself? Is my big question. 
and, and if you have time, not they cut them. <laughs> yeah, my view on this is that, uh, and that's something I've expressed in the Journal of Democracy, uh, Gorgasia, is that the story of the political opposition that has to stand up is both half empty and half full. Mm. Uh, I would say half empty because uh, comparative politics teaches us that under conditions of extreme repression, opposition parties come together. Mm. And that has happened in the case of Iraq. Mm. So mm -hmm. we see a Samajwadi party shaking hands with the Congress party in a way that was unbelievable. Uh, then we also see uh, coalition partners like Mamata Banerjee, who would not even contest elections together, saying that we will stand together. Uh, now, I call this half empty and half full. Half empty because it is it could have happened earlier and it could have happened in a more coherent way. Mm -hmm. And if it had happened in a more coherent way with much better effort from the leader of the Indian National Developmental an inclusive alliance in the National Congress, uh, despite the fact that these elections were compromised, I think there would have been more seats. Yeah. So this is why I call it half M. On the other hand, I also call it half full because it was not an easy uh, enterprise and, and the last new election did not see that. And, and so better late than never, and we've seen it. Yeah. So in my view, the answer to your question will hinge and because I'm not an astrologer, I won't give you an answer, will hinge to a very great extent on how creatively the political opposition can make use of repression to come together against another Unwark ideology. And it should not be so difficult for them because this is a government that has incarcerated chief ministers under reprehensible legal circumstances. So the writing is the what? What's your what's your alternative, right? Yeah. So you don't have to be a Nelson Mandela or Mohandas Gandhi uh, to do this. You you have to be a far more pragmatic politician to understand that the odds are completely against you. The entire so society will turn against you. Your ideology will be dead. So I think it's the political opposition under conditions of Vital depression, where I would say that the ruling dispensation has and is still have been there. And so, you know, all these things that you're talking about, you know, more lynchings, Mrs. Arundhati Roy, Mrs. Arundhati Roy being, and, and you know, I'm sure activists like you are also being hit uh, even more ferociously than in the past. But all of this message has to go to the political opposition, because the political opposition also depends on civil society. And if the political opposition, for the sake of preserving its social capital and its substance from where it can actually regenerate itself and for its own political survival remains intact, then I think this kind of an aggression that we are beginning to see where uh, the coalition leader of a party which doesn't have a simple majority is pretending as if nothing has happened. This can fall apart. And there are enough senior politicians who can make it through that. On the other hand, if it happens that the management of the current ruling coalition is done in such a clever and shrewd way that all those legal strictures, which are completely beyond the purview of what we understand as the rule of law, are used in a manner to intimidate people who have joined the ruling coalition and at the same time to break the current coalition which is not in its either in its short term or long term interests the opposition could then of course we will be moving from a competitive authoritarian to an authoritarian situation and therefore i can't give you an answer but i can basically say that these are the odds uh, uh, i mean every leader who is either hindu nationalists or pretending to be hindu nationalists or sucking up to hindu nationalism has to decide whether that's the future of that leader and every leader in the political opposition who is claiming to fight Indo nationalism has to understand how grave this struggle is. And my view is that what the election results have shown today make it possible for resistance to happen 
it has opened up a window, mm -hmm. a, a small ray of light, but that window can easily be shut if they do not act at this point in time. Now that there is really a very clear eyed kind of uh, yeah, so getting through the window into the future. I just felt saddened that you didn't even talk about the possibility of the ideological and moral commitment of the political opposition to fight what is happening to India's Muslims. That is, I think, to me, in the biggest crisis. And I've noticed that although this was a well fought election battle, the uh, political opposition spoke about jobs, they spoke about prices, they spoke about China, they spoke about uh, other islands, but they didn't speak about the Biden's link systems. Everybody's kept silent about it. Yeah. And I think that it is that complicity that really worries me. And come you mean, surely, and uh, how should uh, here? It's important, I think, to uh, think of the, the the data from the CSTS uh, Loginetti uh, post poll post poll survey, mm -hmm. uh, which okay, some of the findings were, from our point of view, quite quite positive, mm -hmm. but less support for actually fought for minorities That's, than uh, it, than in 2019. It was not. I mean, I, I we we wanted to celebrate, and we said. You feel celebrate, but, uh, but although my politics is based on on some naive optimism, I had to admit that this wasn't a vote against hate. It was a vote for better governance, yeah, and jobs, etc. But not a negation of the politics of hate. And this of I feel uh, perhaps closest to, uh, to to your scholarship on these issues, and therefore. Uh, my question, do you, do you see the election outcome of 2024 leading to a life of greater security, dignity, uh, the dogging, citizenship, when there's an extent? No, I will re re repeat more or less uh, to begin with uh, the metaphor of Raul, uh, the glass as full, the glass as empty. But I would put the emptiness at a lower level. I think the, the glass for me is more full than empty. It's not as half. That's brilliant. And, 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 and for, for, for two reasons. The glass for you is more full. Yes, than empty. Yeah. And I think for two... was a feeling for forward in garage. <laughs> for two reasons. Uh, well, let, let's begin with the emptiness. And it is indeed a reflection of what you've just said. Secularism is not what it used to be in society today. Yeah. The defense of secularism is not what it is. And that I feel is even more. Yes. More. Mm. Yes. Mm. And, and the risk of Narendra Modi insisting on polarizing society is still very much there. You know, look at this election campaign. Yeah. yeah. It was horrible. Never before. You have to go back to 2002, to the Gaurav Yatra. Yeah. 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 It's like that. It, to do see. This repeat of Am Ban Shamane Pachis, you know, you had to go back to 20 years, 22 years before for seeing this kind of communal mm -hmm. overtone. So this is the card he will definitely continue to play. And he has to be careful because there are people on his right who will play it if he doesn't. So that's why the glass is, is partly empty. It is more full than empty for two reasons to my, to my mind. We are at the end of a cycle. And for 40 years, Indian politics has cycles with alternation of two dominant repertoires, mm -hmm. Indudva and caste politics. Mm -hmm. And Indudva is a response to caste politics. Indudva is a response to Mandal. How do you make sure that these low caste people would not take over mm -hmm. by telling them, don't look at the Brahmin or the Patel or whatever, as your enemy, look at the Muslim as your enemy. And it worked. There is no doubt that there is an OBC vote for, even a Dalit vote for mm -hmm. Mopiche. Now this is a little bit over. And what we see is caste politics staging a comeback. You know, the caste census is very similar to the Mandal question. Mm -hmm. One issue for the first time after so many years, one issue around which everybody can rally. When you have to distribute quotas, you're stuck. To whom will you give them? 
when you just have to ask for one single question that is, do you want a caste census? Then you have 75% of the society that will rally on. And it will be very interesting to see how Mr. Nitish Kumar does not support, uh, does not support a caste census. So that's why I think we are at the end of a cycle and the opposition will certainly continue to push in this direction. The other reason is federalism. What is the real mean, institution? The only institution that has resisted authoritarianism? Federalism. Yeah. Now, when you attack chief ministers the way they have attacked chief ministers, when you make the life of the chief ministers in the South, especially, so complicated, yeah. you know, there'll be the really limitation issue coming up. You know, the, the South is almost on a separatist path in many ways. We're pushing them into that. They are pushing them in this direction. So if you have two chief ministers or three chief ministers that are really needed by the ruling coalition, they'll give and take, but they'll take more than they'll give, <laughs> and you'll be back to a, local, a logic renewed. And this is why I just end on this. I, 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 I agree with John, we have to look at uh, things in perspective. No, Indudva did not fall, Narendra Modi, Modi Dva <laughs> did not fall from the sky. It's, it's, it's the, the legacy of history, it's a legacy of definitely Mandal. Yeah. It's a legacy of years of liberal policies. Remember Manmohan Singh mm. being the most decentralized prime minister you ever had in India. Yeah. The man who gave rights to information, right to food, right to education. It's a reaction to that. But again, the cycle may be over and we have to go back to something that was much more Indian. You know. How do you rule India without decentralizing power and recognizing rights? I think this is why the, the, the glass is more than half full. Could I, could I just come in a little bit, uh, just for a moment, uh, in response to uh, to Christoph, I mean, I, I find the idea of coming to the end of a cycle very, uh, very appealing in one way. But I want to come back to something that that you said earlier about the deep state, and I was very struck by the idea of the deep state in the sense of the state that is deeply rooted in in society. And I think what you know concerns me about this present conjuncture is that all the evidence from the surveys and so on and what actually happened in the election are that, uh, okay, it's, it is a minority perhaps of the whole of Indian society, but it is a very substantial minority. And active. And the ideology is, I think, very, the ideology of Hindutva is very deeply rooted um, uh, in in uh, in in society, yeah. and that makes me less convinced than I want to be, <laughs> uh, if you will, at the idea of you know a cycle having come to an end. Except that the antidote in terms of narrative to Indudva is caste, and it can be the solvent of this narrative. <laughs> and 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 just to go back to your point, Arsh, one sentence, yes. Muslims will not be defended as Muslims, but Muslims will benefit from the shift from a narrative that is based on identity to a narrative that is based on social issues. You know, but yeah, but, but can I, because uh, of again, uh, as to Darwin's answer, um, I feel a sort of sense of regret and sadness. Uh, Dr. Baker had spoken about two kinds of majorities, as you would remember, one is a communal majority where you vote because of what you're born. Uh, and the other is a political majority where you vote because of what, what is being promised. In neither caste nor religion, is uh, it ending into a political majority. Are we not, uh, is there no prospect that young Indian voters will say, forget about my religion, forget about my caste, I want jobs, I want a decent education system. I want a healthcare system that works. Um, is there no, isn't that a salvation part which would truly defend democracy? And are there no chances for that? Is my. No, certainly, simply, you know, where are 
the bulk of the voters, not among the young urban urban class people, mm. urban middle class people. They're in the village. And this is where when you look at the election results, this, this is where the opposition won. And that, that, they lost the cities again. Yeah, no, that, that is precisely where I believe that they did, they did start moving towards uh, a, a political uh, sort of uh, a force rather than a communal force, where they were saying, think of us as, as young people looking for jobs, yeah. but think of us as farmers, think of us as... And that is perhaps to me the most hopeful cause for me, not even the mandal versus uh, the mandal, but, 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 yeah, citizenship. I, I, I think, you know, I, I agree with, with you, Harsh, that there is a, there is a possibility there. Uh, but I, th I think that what we desperately need then is the opposition to actually be able to project a different vision of the, of the economic future of the, of the country to project, I would say, actually a, social, a, a vision of social democracy um, uh, and to present, to put that across as the alternative to the kind of crony capitalist version uh, of, uh, of uh, neoliberalism that we've, uh, that we've had. And it's developing that as a, it's a radical new imagination. In fact, I, I, I really strongly believe that what we need is radical new imaginations about how we will buy the economy so that you have decent work and in yeah. funding. Yeah. I'm not hearing that. I'm, not, I'm hearing that we, they're distributing this, we have distributed that, etc., etc. It's not a radical new imagination of how we manage our economy, how we manage our country. So, so yeah, yeah uh, I think that's that's where we need to go. But just looking at my at the watch and uh, may I just enter into this conversation because when I said last half empty and half full, and <laughs> both my colleagues have disagreed with me. Slightly. <laughs> Slightly. <laughs> but I have taken a very safe position I and mean, I'm not an astrologer. <laughs> but I must confess that Christoph is the wine India watcher mm. who says things in advance that people come to realize much later. <laughs> so I, I he has this deadly reputation that you know he talked about the rise of the OBCs uh, much before. Ordinary people like me understood that that mm -hmm. is going to happen. So I, and without becoming becoming an astrologer, I uh, I, I would take uh, his uh, advice seriously and give it a thought. But I just I, I just want to I, I I wish this India watcher would also India living watcher yeah. uh, could. No, I I wish we would move towards no, but I think about a better life. Yeah, but what I what I yeah want, yeah, but what I want to say is that. Uh, that uh, something that we were discussing yesterday, then, you know, the one difference between what we call populism mm. and a lot of the things that we see in ethno-nationalism is that populist leaders often use clientelistic ways mm. to win voters. So getting votes becomes a transaction. Mm -hmm. To the extent that it becomes programmatic, for example, in the implementation of the National Rural Guarantee Scheme in Amit Pradesh, about which we have written, not perfectly non clientelistic but to a much greater extent programmatic, I think political scientists like us today will at least not call it populist. We will say mm -hmm. that this is, this is social level. This is with fascism, with fascism democratic, right? Now, the problem with ethno nationalist leadership is that unlike either the pop populists, or the programmatic social democrats, and they have now tried to bring their voter base to a different causal mechanism, which is by othering the minority mm -hmm. and making the majority feel that that vulnerable minority is threatening them. Mm -hmm. Now, that story, I think what Christoph is saying, has its limits. Now, it will not happen in a perfectly social democratic way, but on the other side, the social democratic experience also lives with us. I mean, there was a right spaced approach. All of that happened within coalition politics and democracy. So we have a variety of seeds that have been planted. And in that plantation, I completely agree with you that not 
following the Indian secular model, not the French secular model, which is Sarva Dharma Samam Bhava, and social democracy, can in the long run be politically debilitating. Because look at the politics literature of the past. Mm -hmm. It talks, I mean, James Maynard and others have written about this, that you can't not but accommodate diversity to win elections, right? Now, these guys have tried a different mode of operation. And what Christoph is saying is that that has reached to a certain extent its limits. And I think this is a believable proposition. Uh, how mm -hmm. the transition to more democratic propensities happen? Maybe not in a perfectly social democratic way. Uh, however, if you have a caste census and you start empowering people who are at aim and underprivileged, uh, in a way that any other decent society would give them something better. I don't see many problems with that. Uh, and, and, the, and the way societies perform actually doesn't of, often happen through the ideal normative framework that we like. Mm. So I, I, I would not, therefore, uh, for these reasons, believe uh, that what Christoph is trying to project is and not to say, why are they believable? So, uh, so we reached a point in our discussion where all our three political astrologers uh, uh, <laughs> give us reason to go. Uh, and uh, I, as somebody who's lived my life in life optimism, am not so persuaded. And, 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 but, but let me go to the second question that I'm looking at my watch. I just read it out. And this is let us look at what do you see as the future of fundamental constitutional freedoms. Do you expect that dissent will no longer be too fraught in danger? Will political prisoners detained for years without trial and be released? With weaponizing of anti terror sedition and money laundering laws end or be restrained? What's basically the freedom of conscience? We talked about the freedom of religion. What, what's going to happen to the freedom of conscience? In this non-ideological alliance, the tactical alliance uh, that Mr. Modi is leading. So uh, let's go this way. Okay. <laughs> What's going to happen to the freedom of conscience? Um, you just wrote a book called... <laughs> exactly. Constitution for us. Yes. I, I... I'm not... I'm not hugely optimistic, to be honest, Hush, mm -hmm. uh, about the, the future of the, the, the fundamental rights. Mm -hmm. um, partly uh, because I, I, I think there are, if you will, certain flaws mm -hmm. in, the, in the constitutional uh, settlement. I mean, I mentioned earlier the extent to which uh, you know, it was said in the constituent assembly debates, that much depends on the great yeah. and on the character, the integrity yeah. uh, of the of the leaders. And Mr. Malita, I think his biggest success in destroying the institutions we not be regret that is by the selection of the people who mm. occupy his position. He had yeah. to do nothing else. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So I, I I I worry that I worry that the there are. There are, if you will, loopholes in the, the le in the most critical legislation uh, it, itself. I mean, the loophole that you and and many of your colleagues, for example, um, uh, 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 wrote wrote that letter about about what three or four years ago about the notification um, of, of uh, the the forty fourth amendment uh, with regard to, uh, to to Article twenty two, so that there should there should be proper judicial scrutiny and of, on, on, of, of pre preventive detention. Uh, that part of the 44th Amendment has, has never been notified after, what, now just about half a, half a century. Mm -hmm. um, that's one particular instance of, uh, of, the, of the, if you will, the loopholes in the in the critical legislation, uh, which make me perhaps, let me put it this way, le less optimistic than I'd like to be uh, about the, in, in a way, the reassertion of, of the fundamental rights 
the reassertion of the values that are cont uh, that are stated in in the uh, in the preamble to the the constitution. Bist du powerful as the glass is but well, on that front I am, I, I share um, John's uh, skepticism and because of what we see on the Supreme Court side. <laughs> If one institution has been surprisingly pliable and disappointing and disappointing it is the Supreme Court of India. When you remember what it was when you remember the the model it was for the world you know the grant the grand Supreme Court of India how do we explain that uh, again we have to look at the sociology of the judiciary it does not help to have upper caste males rather conservative uh, in their uh, no. mindset no. secondly Every man has a price. And if you have post-retirement jobs, you self-censor when you're still in office. But the third is the more worrying one of the ideologically driven. Or, and this is, this, is, this is related to the sociology, mm -hmm. but it is related to the infiltration of the judiciary. Yeah. Yeah. And that's something RSS is working on for decades. Yeah. And they are very good at figuring out who at the high court will be reaching the Supreme Court and when. Yeah. And we may be reaching the moment when all the Chief Justice of India for many years will not be of the same kind anymore. So you have this press, last but not least, and this is something uh, um, Prashant Bhushan said plainly. It's not too difficult to blackmail judges when they have potential cases against them. Yeah. This is something we can't rule out. Corruption of the judges make them very vulnerable vis-a-vis -vis a government who has a fine on everyone. Yeah. So for big reasons, which may not disappear tomorrow, how can they be true to their mission in this context? The only, I mean, ray of hope may come from, well, there may be one sensitive to public opinion, to the movement. You know, the judiciary is never insulated from society. So there is something we saw even in Pakistan, we saw elsewhere. You, you take courage when you have the people pushing you in this direction. And two, the way the rest of the world and the rest of the judiciary in the world is watching then, maybe they're more so sensitive to uh, Well, a kind of Benzamite, <laughs> but yeah. an opticon yeah. of another kind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. But, but we have always remember these 10 years, and um, this is to shoot allowed people to stay in some of our best hearts and minds to stay in prison for three years, four years, five years without the beginning of a trial. And this is a disgrace. He's that allowed uh, the rebuilding and the building of a temple at the site where it was. Or the least is so long and cruel. So, uh, um, you know, around. Uh, Given it, given uh, your special research that you've been doing on uh, the suppression of dissent in civil society, how much do you expect that to change? Can I also reflect on this question and the bits? Yeah. So my view is somewhat different. I don't disagree with the fact that uh, I am not optimistic about the institutions, but I have found and I have done fairly serious research of the telecom regulatory in India which is completely compromised. And we are also looking at the Supreme Court, mm -hmm. somewhat uh, not as a great scholar of the law, but we find that when you have weak coalition governments, you actually get a strong and activist court. Mm. So what happened to the court under Mr. Indira Gandhi? Mm. Very similar to what has happened today. Yeah. And then where did judicial activism come about? when there were coalition governments had passed. So I think the people of India and the politics of India has to change. If the people of India, the politics of India, of course the people of India are sitting still there, politics of India has to change, then it will be relatively easy to bring back these institutions. However, if what I started by saying that this majoritarian propensity, which, which as Christophe and de Ture and de facto are undermining institutions, And if they are able to get away with uh, with it without letting, uh, let's say, 
uh, without letting the political opposition that is actually arrive to have a say, then uh, the judiciary, the Central Bureau of Investigations, I mean, for example, the way in which uh, GEO has become the largest telecom regulator uh, is, is a big scandal. Mm -hmm. And uh, I shared it with you right in Paris. So the point I'm making is that we have to go back to politics. And that politics has to look at civil society and political party as half-half. And I completely agree with you that you cannot be defensive on the questions of the ethnic minority. I mean, that cannot be the way in which you bring... See, politics has to come back, and then institutions will come back. But if you expect institutions to come back before politics comes back, yeah. then uh, I, I don't see. And from that perspective, mm -hmm. answering your question becomes very simple then. That has that politics come back? Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at it as glass of full, you know that there are, you need more than 270 legislatures. The current party doesn't have. Now, what is the extent to which the current dispensation using the same Home Minister and the same Prime Minister will be able to intimidate the judiciary and the opposition, uh, give them carrots and sticks to move ahead? Mm -hmm. Or will the caste sense stand in the way? Or will the fact that uh, Chhatrabahu Naridu has uh, a Muslim voters and he's not going to be a Muslim hater mm -hmm. stand in the way? State elections. State elections in Maharashtra are important. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Nitish Kumar as to live up to his reputation of the caste census. And if all of these things come together, then what we see is the arrogance of what you once called a wounded tiger will end. On the other, if the opposition, as I said, under conditions of enormous repression, uh, loses its path and falls into the intimidation of a dispensation which is still pretending that it has a majority, mm -hmm. Uh, fools the opposition and doesn't scare the opposition enough to come together and unite. And the reason why I am using these pragmatic arguments is because, not because I don't think that the normative argument is important. It is absolutely important. That's the answer. But when you are seeing that people are not coming around to the normative argument, uh, uh, the second best is certainly not the enemy of the best. Yeah. And from that perspective, I would not completely lose my hope because I still have opposition. I mean, if I follow Christoph's perspective that the entire game has not been lost. However, it's it's only a ray of hope. And if the ruling dispensation is able to shut the door and in relation to the research that we have done, uh, we find that civil society in India is actually the major part of the political and social society which is seeing it at. Unfortunately, the media is not looking at this because it is really not such a great thing to talk about. And this part of society is also more vulnerable because it doesn't stand for elections. When you look at so many members of the parliament, you are not looking at saving Dr. Rashwanta. You are not looking at saving Tista Sekalwar. You are not looking at saving, you know, but you are looking at uh, seeing whether Mr. K. is in prison or not. And this is a big problem. Opposition parties have to realize, well, I'm not talking about the ruling party because I have no hope for the ruling party. Why should I waste my time? <laughs> it is very clear. But opposition parties have to understand the importance of Sarvadharma Sawan Baba, that their social base has to emerge from there. And there is a lot of fertility in the Indian soil. To work with that. And if they are able to come together, which is their only hope, then uh, not only will they be able to save civil society, they will be able to save themselves. But if they are unable to do that, and, and the current dispensation continues to do what it does, on the contrary, is even able to divide and despoil the current, uh, then I think the situation is very bad. But what's really the resilience part of it, and our research actually shows that uh, people like Harsh and others who have been defending minority rights uh, most vigorously among the civil society organizations of India are also the most intensively hit. 
And this is clearly coming out in our research based on primary materials that friends have shared. Uh, so, so, so politics has to realize this. And politics also has to realize that these are the very voters who are poor and who are, who are, who are big minority, but an ethnic minority. Uh, and with a lot of others who are in the majority community who still haven't stopped voting for this idea have to come together. And, uh, and, 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 and therefore, I kind of end again with not the idea that one can be very optimistic, but the glass is half full and it is half empty. I would say that the story is not over, but it is... It's a barking bit. But, but, the, but, the, but, but, but you know, what is looking like a major challenge today of the wounded tiger, we have to see whether it heals or whether it lets, leads to its ultimate device. Very, very thoughtful. I, I uh, we just have a few minutes, but uh, I did want to take on from the last set of questions is what it should happen if the institutions of democracy repair. You know, like uh, uh, you know, what we speak, the freedom of conscience, the freedom of religion, all of these can be defended if uh, the judiciary, parliament start, to start with, the political opposition, uh, the higher judiciary, uh, the civil service, we forget, uh, uh, the media, uh, the liberal arts university, and civil society. All of these, uh, until they rebel, uh, the other two uh, sort of sets of democratic freedoms, there'd be no one to defend. Um, so will they at last discover their spine? Will, will they at last find their voice? And most importantly, will they find their conscience? Uh, so just just a minute from both of you and, and, and then we look forward. John Burke. Um, I'm ever so sorry, Harsh, I'm not entirely sure of what your, what your question is. I do apologize. I'm adopting the prospect of the institutions that were designed to keep the executive in check and accountable. Yep. Uh, are they going to are they going to find again their voice and conscience and spy it? Um, I'm, I'm almost speechless <laughs> because <laughs> because I, I I I do have some hope. Uh, because there are a lot of a lot of people uh, in those institutions of character. Who, uh, of character who do actually hold the the values that are enshrined, if you will, in in the constitution as as you know central to their to their lives. Um, there are plenty of others uh, who don't hold those values, and to go back to some of the. The, of uh, your, your earlier comments, Hush, uh, who are, I think, fairly committed to uh, the ideology uh, of the, the present uh, ruling dispensation. But I think there is always uh, there are always grounds for hope mm -hmm. in the fact that there are still a lot of people out there in those institutions who are fighting all the time uh, for the values of. Uh, of of the democracy and yeah. what 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 india can recapture is the sense of diversity mm -hmm. and i would emphasize that rather than values values being a kind of bonus I, I know it's very strange to use these kind of words but i think power stops power more than anything else and federalism reflecting diversity will help to make the center more vulnerable, more uh, bargain-oriented, more coalition-oriented. Secondly, we know what it is to be Indian the non-Bharat way, you know, to be Hindustani, yeah. to go to the Darga and meet people of a different religion. Absolutely. This is the civilization mm -hmm. that is under attack today and that can be recaptured. You cannot say this is rooted in 
values in the sense that it's more a culture than a value for me. Yeah, it's a civilizational kind of uh, legacy that yeah. people can... That can be recaptured. So it will be something like diversity, cultural, linguistic, religious diversity, returning, re be, re yeah, becoming again the alpha and omega of civil society. And if you stop the majoritarian, authoritarian kind of power, inevitably it will come. Because it is there. And if you remove the people who are under the thumb, that's what we saw after the emergency. You know, for 17 months, people were frozen in time and, and very docile. Mm -hmm. Now it's not 17 months, it's 10 years. So of course, the damage is, is bigger. But I would suggest that, yes, if we want the values to prevail again, it is through the diversity that is there that we can recapture that. I, I, I think that's a, that's, a great, that's a great thought to end this conversation with. Uh, I, in the nature of my work, uh, all, all my life, I've been, uh, my fine staying with the most underprivileged and dispossessed of Indians. And for them, this is a way of place. I mean, this is not something that, uh, uh, you know, and often they use the metaphor that, you know, imagine a garden with just one set of one kind of flowers, how boring it is. We are such a beautiful country because there are all kinds of flowers with all kinds of color. And I think mm -hmm. that idea of itself will, will prevail. It is, it, it is that hope. Yeah. And, 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 you know, very reluctantly, I bring this conversation to a close and I hope we can sit together maybe a year later or months later to see it, uh, you know, how, how well your astrology has. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I hope that all the, all the um, you know, um, in the, the despair that one is being pulled into uh, proves poorly uh, founded. <laughs> and, and, and that we find more and more reason to predict. And hope is, I think, a public duty. Mm. Uh, and, and let me end with, uh, with with a poem that keeps coming back to me by Rabindranath Tagore, where he's talking about the country he wants to build. He wants to see where the mind is without fear, where the head is held high, where knowledge is free, where the world has not been broken up, into narrow domestic walls, into that heaven of freedom, let my country obey. Ye daag daag ujala ye shab gazida zahar, wo intazar tha jiska, ye wo zahar tumhe.